or like you came up with a business idea and it's going against Amazon, Google, and Facebook, I'm sorry, Meta, <laughs> if it's going against those three, it's going to be a little bit harder. People might take you seriously, but it's also going to be you trying to, I hate the term, but I can't think of a better one, steal the audience from these billion, trillion dollar companies. Instead, you're working quietly, building up this minimal vial of audience. Hi, my name is Damon Brown of DamonBrown.net. My main thing is helping you as a side hustler, a solopreneur, otherwise a non-traditional entrepreneur. Today we're gonna to talk about when you aren't being taken seriously, right? Kind of like Joe Pesci, am I a comedian to you? You think I'm a clown? Sometimes we come up with these business ideas, particularly ideas that are out of left field and we're just not taken seriously with the ideas. I've come up with a bunch of ideas and sometimes people literally will laugh in my face. But if you think about some of the biggest or strongest or most influential, which has always been my focus, companies in our modern history, if you think about them, they sound pretty silly. Airbnb, you're gonna have random people stay at your house and then charge them money. Uber or Lyft, you're gonna have other people use their cars and then you're gonna take a surcharge <laughs> for them driving people around. Even my own idea, Cuddler, which connected people for hugs. People thought it was absurd, but all those examples ended up becoming successful in the long run, or more importantly, like I said, changing culture. So today we're gonna to talk about why it's actually an advantage when people think you are a joke. We're gonna give two solid reasons why. My name is Damon Brown of DamonBrown.net. This is the Bring Your Worst Show. I'm coming to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. If you're liking what you're hearing or this is more of the content that you want, feel free to subscribe. Hey, got it at the right place. Subscribe button's over there. <laughs> it's free. There's about 220, 230, going on 250 episodes uh, over the past couple of years. I've been doing the show. Thank you for all the love and support. This keeps going. Uh, this is part of my coaching practice. So I actually have a coaching practice over again at DameBrown.net. It's my way of giving some of that coaching energy um, and putting it out there and helping hopefully change the culture in interesting ways. If there's other people that you think might like this kind of programming, share it with them because we can get there better together. I think that's how the saying goes. Anyway, when people take you as a joke, it is so important to understand, number one, the power of your own ideas, and number two, that if you're actually doing something innovative or innovative, as people say nowadays, <laughs> If you're doing something innovative, see, I can't even say it. We'll say it the old way. When you're doing something innovative, it's going to be different. If you're going to be changing the culture and you don't want to do the status quo, then why would everyone understand what you're trying to do unless it was a status quo, right? There's a built-in contradiction. As creators, as solopreneurs, such as myself, and maybe like yourself, we're going to be doing things that are different, that are ideally radical, I would say. Whether it's uh, doing a book, doing a TV show, doing an app or a startup, a new business, even doing keynotes, which I do keynotes as well. It's so important to know and respect where your ideas are coming from and that other people might not get them right away. But more importantly, there's two strategic ways why actually people not taking you seriously can be a great thing. Number one, as I was saying, most things that end up changing the culture are considered absurd. It doesn't make any sense. If you think about the way that we function as an environment right now, again, let's go to the example of Airbnb. When they started, it was around the time I was living in Silicon Valley. So it's from 2008 to 2011, around that time they had started. When they started, they couldn't, they couldn't get any attention from any venture capitalist. It's just two, I think they might've been post-grad, maybe even college kids, who there was an event happening. I wanna say it was a yacht event. I wanna say America's Yacht, something to that effect. Feel free to look it up online. Because there's a lot of big wigs that come into town in San Francisco, let me be specific, very high rent. It's kind of like the West Coast version of Manhattan. Again, I lived there for a while. Very expensive city. 
So what the, the two young guys decided to do is to say, look, a bunch of people are gonna be coming to San Francisco for this boating event, right? I think it's a boating race actually, so it must not be a yacht. For this boating race, why don't we go ahead and rent out the spare room in our apartment and then go from there? That's literally how it started. And it was something on Craigslist that they end up doing. And there's a fascinating story behind it. <laughs> Lots of adventures, including selling things on the side. And they were like serious hustlers. So shout out to, to, um, to Brian as well as Joe, who are the two founders of it. But when they started this thing, they were getting laughed out of venture capitalist offices. Think about it. Like, let's just sit with this for a second. My partner and I, my wife, we we have or can make a spare bedroom if we're gonna move the kids around and all that stuff, right? We're gonna have a stranger come into this house who we just met through a website, pay us up front, and then just live in our house. That sounds absurd. It sounds absurd. The only two cases before that where you would see that happening is if, um, well, if someone was adopted, <laughs> if you had some type of in-home cleaning service like a maid or a butler <laughs> or you had some relative that came from out of town and you barely knew them when that idea was first struck people thought they were crazy and they went uphill and then suddenly the culture changed you might have these ideas that are brilliant that are great that are different right the key thing is different the wave the flow of the culture might be going in one direction Yours might be going a little bit against it or 100% against it. You are going to encounter friction. If you have an idea that no one else has thought of, or more importantly, that no one else has executed, then why don't you think that the other people who tried to do it weren't able to make it? Or if you have a new idea that really is truly radical, where it's your idea and no one else has literally thought about it before, which is pretty rare, then it's going to go against the cultural norms. So you are going to get that pushback. Now, it's important to differentiate between uh, constructive criticism and feedback and being shut down and being, you know, being straight up critical. And that's why it's important to have people in your circle who, what I call your brain trust, people who you know, people who you trust, people who know what direction you're trying to go at with your career, how you're trying to impact the world, and we'll check you, give you feedback, help you along when you come up with these ideas. But when you come up with these new ideas, you're gonna have some pushback. Number two, this is crucial. When people don't take you seriously, you're allowed to work quietly. I'm an introvert, I love working quietly. <laughs> I'm literally talking to you in the screen. You don't see a bunch of people behind me. This is, this is totally by design, right? This is not by accident. Beyond that, no matter how you work, you're talking about the inner process and the outer process. And they're both equally important. And those are both advantageous when people aren't taking you seriously. When people aren't taking you seriously, you actually have time to work on what Seth Godin calls a minimal viable audience. In other words, finding the people that are super fans or people who really are into your product, whatever term you want to use, building that audience. If you're coming up with something or trying to do something that a million other people are doing, or like you came up with a business idea and it's going against Amazon, Google, and Facebook, I'm sorry, Meta, <laughs> if it's going against those three, it's gonna be a little bit harder. People might take you seriously, but it's also gonna be you trying to, I hate the term, but I can't think of a better one, steal the audience from these billion, trillion dollar companies. Instead, you're working quietly, building up this minimal viable audience. It also allows you to create in peace, which is so important, we tend to undervalue that. When we come up with an idea, so often we want to have the big flashing lights, have the attention, have the press care about what we're doing. But sometimes that uh, inclement climb, 
I think that's the term, that slow climb is the best way. And sometimes you're on the dark side of the mountain and then suddenly you appear at the top. That was the case with um, me and my two co-founders when we did Cuddler. Again, it's an app that connects, connects people for hugs. We had launched it in 2014 and the people that we were sharing the idea with thought it was absurd but interesting. Essentially, it's like Tinder or Grindr, which are called hookup apps. And those are for connecting with people sexually. This was not that. This was a version of that, but strictly platonic. So if you felt like you needed a physical touch, if you had a rough day and you needed a hug and you didn't have anybody around, you can pull out your phone, you know, go ahead and put your location, find other people in the area who are up to cuddle or have a hug, and then say, yes, I'd like to connect. And then you connect in a public space and have a hug. That was it. We ended up having 100,000 users within the first week and 10,000 completed cuddles uh, back when we launched again in September of 2014. The key was this. When we launched, we were one of, if not the laughing stock of Silicon Valley and particularly beyond. The New York Post, uh, a paper that I wrote for quite a bit at that time, actually was roasting the app. <laughs> it's like, I'm one of your freelancers. How are you going to roast my app? But they did. So did a lot of daytime talk shows. We're on the late night talk shows. You can look up C-U-D-D-L-R. Just Google it. You'll see a ton of stuff, mostly within the first week. But two things happen. Number one, obviously we got a ton of attention, which is beautiful. But our app was already out. But number two, no one was taking it seriously. They were like, this app is silly. No one wants to connect with other people for hugs. But me and my two co-founders, we trusted our vision. We we're like, no, this is what the people want. So it was against the grain. It was original and people were laughing at it. Within a year, we had a quarter million users and I'm getting acquired and we all end up getting paid. But it started to other people as a joke. The fact that people didn't take it seriously actually helped because when Cuddler came out, again, we got a ton of attention, most of it negative, for lack of a better term. And then within about a month, maybe six weeks, suddenly you start to see the clones come in. Cuddle here, Cuddle Match. I can't even remember the name of them. <laughs> they were all pretty bad. <laughs> no shots at y'all, just, they were clones. They were clones of the original thing that me and my partners created. They were clones. If people took us seriously in the beginning, if people were watching our every move while we were creating the app, then that competition would have been there from the very first day. In fact, they could have beaten us to the punch. Because again, we're three bootstrapping folks. We all have our day jobs. <laughs> we were not professional entrepreneurs. It had only been my second startup. And my first one was super, super small. And for the other two folks, they had never really worked with startups on that level that we were doing. So it's not like we were professionals, but we had the early advantage. That's the secret when people don't take you seriously, you get the early advantage. And then you're able to run the race based on your original idea, but you have to be willing to take the heat and understand that people aren't gonna always embrace your idea when you first come up with it. They're not always gonna get your concept. That's why it's your concept. It's not somebody else's vision, it's yours. It's a gift to you. Your job, if you want to make an impact on the culture, is to carry it through to the finish line. This is the Bring Your Worst show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. Um, again, there's a smattering of episodes. Feel free to subscribe. It's free. As far as I can tell, it'll always be free. <laughs> and feel free to check out my new book. It just came out, Career Remix. Get the gig you want based on the skills you've got. Uh, a lot of my coaching methods in there, a lot of my insights, some of the conversations that I've had with y'all, um, or at least some of the insights from that, because I, I wouldn't call y'all by name, but <laughs> some of the insights from that and some of the conversations that we've had over the years, they're locked into here. And thank you for all the wonderful feedback. It's also available in audiobook, digital, and all those good platforms. Until next time, remember that you can always bring your worth and that you can always build from now. Take care.